Good evening and welcome to the University of Tasmania's second forum on the future of work as part of our Island Wide Views public lecture series, The Future of Work Skills for a Changing World. As a reflection of our institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this land, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the traditional owners of Lutarita, Tasmania, the Palawa people, the original custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting today. We pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm Dr Terry Simpkin, an Associate Professor in Management and MBA Director at the Tasmanian School of Business and Economics, and it's an absolute pleasure to be with you and our panellists today. The Island of Ideas series commenced in 2020 as a way of connecting our community and ideas while we were unable to host face-to-face -face public events. The program continues in 2022 in the hope that we can continue to connect Tasmania's community and research to people across our regions and into a global network of ideas and emerging issues. Each year, the university presents hundreds of lectures, forums, seminars and workshops to nurture the ongoing learning of students, our alumni, and of course, the wider community. These conversations are an important part of the university's role. Connection, collegiality, and community date back to our founding and are present in the very core of our Tasmanian values. As we continue to navigate the still uncertain post-COVID landscape, we hope this series can be one of the small positive outcomes of the otherwise tragic global pandemic. So before we start, there are of course a few housekeeping matters before we get underway. Your microphone, your camera, your chat function and the raise hand function have all been disabled to protect your privacy. But we do encourage you to ask questions and this can be done at any time by typing into the Q&A function that you can see on your screens. Of course, you can ask questions anonymously, and we'll endeavour to address all of these during the Q&A session a little later in the evening. We'll be conducting a couple of audience polls during this webinar, the first of which is now on your screen, so please feel free to participate. We'd love to know more about who you are and how you feel about the issues we'll discuss tonight. Finally, the lecture is being recorded for later access on our YouTube and SoundCloud channels. I'll give you details of how to find these later in the session. Of course, if you're watching on a delayed version of this lecture via YouTube, for example, you'll not have access to the polls. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second forum in a series of three that the University of Tasmania is hosting on the future of work. History demonstrates that in times of great uncertainty and upheaval, such as war, economic shocks, natural disasters, or political conflict, society experiences rapid change. Whether the change is in our governing philosophies, art, technology or industry, we innovate at high speed in response to these trials that we face. And of course, navigating the post COVID-19 global pandemic has been no different. Indeed, in the middle of last year, McKinsey suggested that we'd experienced 10 years of advancement in business in just nine months and Microsoft CEO suggested that they had achieved two years of digital transformation in just two months. So the way that we, have, we live has evolved and the workforce, of course, also needs to respond. The economic and employment recovery from COVID pandemic has been strong in many jurisdictions, but the nature of work and how work is included in our lives has and will continue to change in a range of significant ways. Indeed, the pandemic has not only amplified and accelerated some workforce matters that were in play prior to the pandemic, but what impact does this raft of changes have on the demands of employers? How should skills, broader capabilities, education and training respond to these demands? And how can we develop, retain, reward and attract a workforce in a sustainable way? And of course, how can we mitigate potential problematic impacts? So I'd like to introduce you now to the panel. Our experts uh, will explore all of these topics and more, and we'll be asking them about how we can work as a community to build resilience to identify what capabilities matter and how we might create a better future for all. So a warm welcome to Professor Kitty Dodrilo, 
Deputy Director of Research, Peter Underwood Centre for Educational Attainment, the University of Tasmania. We also have Dr. Mark Dean, Laurie Carmichael Distinguished Research Fellow at the Carmichael Centre, Centre for Future Work at the Australian Institute, and Dr. Brendan Churchill, ARC Fellow, Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. Welcome to you all. But first, I'd like to start with you, Mark. The work you do with the Carmichael Centre is about building a deeper understanding of industrial relations, unions, and social manufacturing and industry policy. But what are some of your research in insights that you'd like to share with us today? Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you for having me along tonight. Um, uh, just quickly like to pay my respects to the uh, uh, Boonurung people of the Kulin Nation, whose lands are joining you from tonight. Uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, so I've shared, this is my only slide because um, I'm going to paint some broad brushstrokes, I suppose, to get to the to the bottom of uh, what some of the, the work we do at the Carmichael Centre is focused on. Um, I think uh, basically, I, I think that we focus too much on the future part of the term future of work. Uh, and at the Carmichael Centre uh, and more broadly at the Centre for Future Work of which the Carmichael Centre is a project, uh, we've aimed to draw more attention to the fact uh, that's been abundantly evident throughout history that simply work, uh, that is the activities that we all as a society carry out, uh, whether that's paid work or voluntary work, is the economy. And so the way we value work is dependent on what we're using to, to qualify it. Um, I mean, try running an economy without workers uh, and you won't get very far. Um, and when we think about the future of work, often the focus is on how work and workplaces can be reorganized in ways that yield positive outcomes. Uh, but those outcomes are subjective, uh, positive outcomes for whom? And, and that's really what we focus on at, uh, at the Centre for Future Work and particularly the Carmichael Centre. It's, it's a huge focus on work and uh, how that can be explored through industry and social policy and, uh, and industrial relations indeed. Um, so the work we do isn't always the best way to do things from the perspective of enriching human lives. Uh, and arguably, this is certainly the case in the current political and economic landscape. Um, so much of my research has sought to uncover how we can interpret this in terms of what the fourth industrial revolution represents for work, technology, society, and the future, and how we might think more about what quality work looks like. Uh, and so this slide that I have uh, sharing with you uh, depicts four major industrial revolutions in modern history. Uh, and if we begin with the first, we can see that uh, uh, the first was driven by the mechanization of, of uh, industry and um, using water and steam power to do so. Uh, but when we think about the, the impact on work, we can see that the application of machines to production removed much of the need for skilled artisans and tradespeople to produce very bespoke and individually creative outputs. So um, the reason for this was that they vastly scaled up production at this time uh, in, in between the 1760s and the, in the 1840s, roughly, and, uh, and the, it was standardised. Uh, it was targeted at markets, uh, very much the creation of the capitalist system and, and therefore capitalist industrial relations, which needed uh, employers and workers. Uh, and, and this also tells us that the capitalist system was a coercive and enforced process that removed the power of control over uh, creativity from uh, the artisans, from the creators. And, uh, and we've perhaps all heard of the Luddite movement, which is often uh, mistakenly understood as, as people that were anti-technology. And in fact, the Luddites were uh, creative producers that were struggling against the removal of their control over the creative process. Um, and so when we move to the second industrial revolution, uh, which was uh, mass production aided by electricity and assembly lines, this implied the division of production to individual parts that broke down complex processes of making things uh, and entrenching managerial control over production that deepened specialization in work so that any individual worker was only capable of producing a specific part of an overall product. Uh, and, and so that you can see is further uh, put, uh, placing control uh, over, over the work uh, of, of individuals and over uh, the ability for people to collaborate when you, when you divide things up into specialist parts. And so by the time we get to the third industrial revolution uh, and the arrival of computerization and automation in the late 1960s, when this was applied to production lines, it intensified the degree of standardized mass production to the point of further separating the worker from control over the creative process, uh, producing more hierarchical management structures and determining performance and productivity with spreadsheets and numbers instead of how meaningful work might be. 
And so then, of course, it brings us to the fourth industrial revolution, that which is supposedly occurring uh, around us in, in the world today. Um, this contemporary experience is, is tending to blur the lines between the digital and the physical worlds by integrating the internet deeper into our working lives and supposedly making production more connected digitally, but often resulting in work that is more automated and atomized. And so when we think of all of those uh, stages in industrial revolution throughout history, we kind of ask the question about what this process of transformation shows us. Well, first of all, of course, it shows that there's been immense, immensely greater productivity, efficiency and wealth created from these processes, from these revolutions. But the emphasis on the future in this view of the future of work hides the cost to work and the impact that this has had on workers. In, in, in fact, it's been our removal from the labour process and it has also diminished our creative control over work and technological change that's made us specialise, as I mentioned, um, so that we focus our expertise in the narrowest possible skill sets. And in the process of that, we make the future of work so single-mindedly focused on technology without deeper considerations of what this might look like from a human-centred approach to work. And so ultimately what I think the future of work needs to provide for workers is the opportunity to become generalists, as well as specialists, but also generalists. So we need to better understand that both are required to recognise human work will continue to be critical to navigating technological changes. But we can't just rely on specialisation because of how detrimental that is to the human experience in the work process. Um, and so at the Carmichael Centre, our policy research has emphasised the critical role of workers and their unions in helping to shape the labour process and pursue lifelong learning. Uh, that is building capacity to understand production at all of its points, uh, participate in designing better workplaces and industrial relations, and ultimately striving towards industrial democracy. So this is giving workers the power to shape work, control the labour process and determine how technological change benefits all in society. So uh, that's that's the broad view of uh, of this process, um, which which I, I'll be really interesting to uh, interested to uh, to discuss this in the finer detail. But I think that that's a really interesting starting point from my perspective to understand how work has led uh, and and technological change for that matter has led us to an increasingly specialized uh, way of understanding work and in fact understanding the future. Thanks, Mark. I think that's given us a really good platform on which to scaffold the rest of our conversation. There's um, a number of really interesting and key points that you brought up that we'll unpack a little bit later on. But before we get to the Q&A, uh, of course, please make sure that um, if you've got questions for any of our panellists, please um, put your questions into the Q&A uh, box and we'll, we'll uh, address those as uh, we move through the session tonight. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce our next panellist, Brendan. Your work looks at youth underemployment in Australia and has a particular emphasis on how some who might find themselves on the margins of the labour market um, find you know, so-called good jobs. What are some of the insights from your research, please? Uh, thanks, Terry, and it's good to be joining everyone tonight. Um, I just, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the Wurundjeri lands and I'd like to pay my uh, respects to elders past and present. Um, and I'd also like to thank the organisers for the invitation and it's good to speak um, at a University of Tasmania event. I am a Tasmanian graduate, so it's lovely to be here this evening. Um, so I'm a work sociologist, a sociologist of um, employment and much of my focus is on young people. Um, so I'm really interested in how young people experience employment, what do they do with underemployment, uh, how do they get good quality jobs and how the future of work debates are kind of shaping some of this stuff. Um, and so much of the future of work debates um, are really focused on job losses. Uh, who is going to uh, lose out of the future of work? Uh, who, are the, who are the winners? And in these kinds of scenarios, you know, automation and artificial intelligence are positioned as disruptors and there are going to be some losers. Um, consultancy companies like KM KMPG take delight in telling us that, you know, it'll be uh, women who would be advantageous in the future of work because they're overrepresented in the care sector, and it'll be men in manufacturing who will be likely disadvantaged. And of course, there's some truth to this, there will be some winners and there'll be losers. But ultimately, um, you know, the uh, magnitude of change is overstated. Change is constant. Uh, some jobs will go, but in their place, others will appear. 
And this is something that um, we need to think through. Um, we need to shift away from this kind of winners and losers binary and start to think about quality jobs. Um, we need to move past that kind of idea that there is labour scarcity, um, that there'll be not enough qualified people for jobs of the future, and think about job scarcity, which is a concept that um, sociologists are thinking about, you know, that there'll be not enough good quality jobs or jobs that are kind of appropriate for people's skills. Um, but this means, that this, need, this means that we need to think about how we think about these things. And I'm really interested in what does this mean for young people because for a long time we've been thinking that the best thing for people is more education and this is something that they've certainly internalised. You know, we need to keep young people in education or we need to make sure that young people reach university. Um, but this might not necessarily mean that uh, young people are best positioned or that this might make them uh, safeguarded from the future of work. So I want to think through some of these issues and then I want to end with how young people think about the future of work. So this graph here is a very, very simple graph that looks at the proportion of all young people in full-time and part-time work, and it's looking at two time periods, pre-GFC, which is roughly between 2001 and 2009, and post-GFC, which is 2010 to 2019. And the solid line represents full-time work, uh, the solid blue line re represents full-time work, and the solid grey line represents part-time work uh, pre-GFC and the broken lines represent full-time and part-time work post-GFC and what you can see is that uh, pre-GFC with the solid lines um, young people mostly do make it into full-time work about 60 percent by the age of 25 are in full-time work um, and about uh, roughly 20 percent are in part-time work uh, but what you see post-GFC with the broken lines is, is that it takes a little bit longer in the period post-GFC for um, young people to enter into full-time work. You can see that it roughly takes um, until about their 28 in the post-GFC years to reach that peak number of 60%. So what that's telling you is, is that young people's employment outcomes in the post-GFC era have become um, poorer. It takes them longer to get into full-time work because they spend a little bit more time in part-time work. And we can see that actually, this is also the case for those with tertiary qualifications. While they do peak much earlier in the pre-GFC years, they get to about 70% by the time they're 23, 24. Um, Post-GFC, it takes them a lot longer. In fact, you can kind of see that it doesn't close. The gap between the solid and broken blue lines takes quite a long time, up until they're about 30 to close. This is telling you, again, that uh, economic opportunities, employment of outcomes for young people have worsened in this period. But you wouldn't know it. Um, what is really interesting here is that there's been lots of evidence, just not only those graphs that I showed you, but the Productivity Commission has found that young people are getting stuck in um, middle rung occupations, their incomes are stalling, but this doesn't seem to have affected young people. They're clearly not aware of it. Uh, these five domains here, job satisfaction, satisfaction with hours, satisfaction with pay, satisfaction with job security and satisfaction with the job itself show no difference over the two time periods or between those with degrees or out without degrees. And what this is perhaps suggesting to us is that young people are becoming increasingly normalised or they're becoming accepting of um, increasing precarity. Um, they're grateful to have um, employment in whatever shape or form it comes in. So against this backdrop, I've been kind of interested in, well, how do young people think about the future of work? What does this mean for them? How are they kind of positioning themselves? And this is a series of questions that I have looked at using some high quality longitudinal data. And we can see that roughly around 40% of young people expect to be working in the same job regardless of whether they have a degree or not. Um, but we can also see that those with degrees are more likely to expect to work in the same occupation, but in a different job within that occupation. So meaning they expect to advance at some point. Those without a degree qualification are less certain. They're less certain that they might be able to jump to the next, next rung or the next job within their broader occupational field. 
Uh, one in 10 young people without a degree expected that job will cease in 10 years. That's telling us that those young people without a degree qualification are not so confident. I think what's most interesting uh, on this slide is that uh, young people um, with degrees and without degrees are very much pro-learning. Uh, they very much believe in future education and future training. Um, you know, especially even those with uh, degrees, they expect to undertake further training. Um, and this is a very uh, pro-education cohort. Um, I asked young people to kind of elaborate on some of their future plans. Um, many young people could see that change was on the horizon. So this is a, a male learning designer with a postgraduate degree living in a capital city. He says, work's constantly evolving at an incredible pace. Uh, working with technology as a learning designer has shown me that in the near future, this role will be significantly different. Uh, similarly, uh, a young hospital clerk said, there'll be, fewer young people, there'll be fewer people working in the same or similar capacity to me in the next five to 10 years. Um, although she thinks COVID's necessarily Change, delayed some of that change. Um, those with tertiary qualifications were not worried. Um, and this is because they kind of felt like they were protected. Um, you know, they thought that they had the right skills. Um, you know, the male public servant there says, I think I've developed the right sort of skills to remain flexible as the nature of work changes. Um, a lot of young people in professions like nursing and teaching were also not fearful about change. Um, others who were not in safe industries, you know, very much thought that they needed to take future study. Um, but this was also true of those even who were in low risk occupations. So many of them had future plans. They wanted to undertake master's degrees, MBAs, um, even, those, even those who said they were, you know, doctors or nurses, they still had plans to kind of further their education. And so in summary, it's kind of getting harder for young people, especially since the post uh, global financial period. It's taken younger people longer to find full-time and part-time employment. Um, and when they find employment, it's not necessarily good employment. It's true of those with and without degrees. Uh, young people are getting stuck, but they're ultimately grateful. Poor employment outcomes do not necessarily align with how they think and feel about workplace security in terms of pay and income and overall job satisfaction, um, but they're confident about their future. What was really interesting is when talking to young people, they didn't really talk about automation and artificial intelligence. That's not how they saw the future of work. They very much saw it as, well, how can I best position myself for the future? Uh, what things do I need to do? And a lot of that was very much focused on the education. It was something they internalised. Um, and I guess the thing that I want to think through is at what cost? Um, in the earlier slides, I showed you that it's taking a little bit longer for graduates to get into full-time work. Um, and increasingly, young people with degrees find themselves um, represented in part-time work, precarious work, even the gig economy, um, while at the same time, costs for education are increasingly rising. So uh, what is the trade-off here between uh, these outcomes um, and the costs of education? Thanks very much, Brendan. There's some fascinating statistics there that we've put together with the material that we've heard from Mark already. And we'll move on to our next speaker, so Kitty. Your work with the Peter Underwood Centre for Educational Attainment is focused on how education can support marginalised young people to improve their life chances. Uh, what do you think of the current state of play? How should educators respond? Over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Terry. Um, so I'll share a, a PowerPoint as well to take us through some of these ideas. Um, and I'm going to be focusing particularly on Tasmania um, and on uh, young people, a little bit younger than Brendan's young people, um, young people at, at school. Um, I'm from the Peter Underwood Centre and, and our mission is to support all children and young people to flourish through the power of learning. Um, so first, um, a little bit of background about Tasmania and the Tasmanian context. Um, people often mention that Tasmania lags behind the rest of Australia in terms of its school attainment. Um, and that's true, uh, but the good news is that the gap is decreasing. Uh, so this graph is based on data from the, the report on government services from the Product Productivity Commission. Um, and the blue lines are about year 12 attainment. 
um, and the dark one is Tasmania and the lighter one is, one is Australia. And so what you can see is that the gap between Tasmania and Australia uh, went down from 26% in 2012 to 17% in 2020 in terms of uh, attaining year 12. The orange lines are about the retention from year 10 to year 12. So how many students in year 10 are still there in, in year 12? And again, the darker line is, is Tasmania. And again, the gap reduces from 13% in 2012 to 8% in 2020. Now, the reason that we have this um, a narrowing of the gap may have something to do with the 2016 Education Act in Tasmania. Uh, all young people in Tasmania now have to continue in education or training until they complete year 12 or obtain a certificate three or they turn um, 18. In other jurisdictions, that tends to be age 17, so a bit older in Tasmania. And to help young people meet this new requirement, uh, both government schools and Catholic schools, uh, many of them are extending from offering year seven to 10 only, which was the tradition, to now also offering year 11 and 12. Um, this diagram um, is based on research by the Peter Underwood Centre uh, with a survey last year uh, of students from year 10, 11 and 12, where we had over, over a thousand students respond. And we asked them if they agreed with a list of possible benefits of completing year 12. Uh, and overwhelmingly the results show that year 12 is highly valued, um, especially for um, more general benefits like opening up opportunities and helping them to develop their career goals. Also in terms of instrumental benefits like being useful to go to university in particular, uh, but also useful for getting skills for a job or for an apprenticeship. Um, and overwhelmingly agreeing uh, with the more emotional dimensions that, um, for example, it will make their family proud um, to stay in school um, and complete year 12. So I hope that this helps to dispel the persistent myth that Tasmanians have low aspirations. At the same time, it is important to recognise that educational inequality continues to be a problem in Tasmania. And in the context of pandemic recovery, support for all of our young people to complete school and fulfil their hopes for the future is even more important. Now to prepare young people for the future of work, 21st century capabilities are essential. So those more generic capabilities. While specific technical skills are always needed as well, uh, these broader capabilities are even more significant as jobs evolve. In the Australian curriculum, uh, these 21st century capabilities are referred to as general capabilities. So they include literacy and numeracy and ICT capability as really foundational capabilities, but also expertise such as critical thinking and creativity um, and social interactions such as ethical and intercultural understandings. It's really interesting to note that similar categories of capabilities have been proposed by the OECD, the World Economic Forum, the Business Council of Australia. And these capabilities matter because young people growing up today will experience jobs that are yet to be created, technologies that are yet to be invented, and social, economic and environmental challenges yet to be anticipated. So these 21st century capabilities help young people to flourish in this changing world. Now, if you know any young people, you also know that our young people already have a range of capabilities. Of course, these capabilities vary from one young person to another, and some strengths will be more obvious than others. And in particular, it's important that we recognize the capabilities of disadvantaged young people who may come across a bit different from people that many of us are used to, but who have a lot to offer. So for example, a young person who's grown up in poverty or who is a carer for um, a younger sibling or who has fled in, uh, war in their home country, they're likely to have, because they've had to develop this to survive, they're likely to have excellent communication, teamwork, creative thinking and problem solving skills. So in general, to recognize their strengths, 
the vital thing is that we listen to young people themselves. But there are also two specific ways in which we can recognise young people's capabilities. So the first one, going beyond the ATAR, um, driven by the pandemic, but based on research by the Underwood Centre about what makes for success in undergraduate study. In 2020, the University of Tasmania developed an alternative entry pathway into most courses. It's called the Schools Recommendation Program. And it uses a rubric with seven key attributes that are generic rather than referring to particular courses. The results have been um, more students from disadvantaged backgrounds enrolling at the university. And importantly, the academic results of students who are enrolled through this recommendation program are on par with students who are enrolled in previous years. And the second specific way is to go beyond the CV. Now, this idea comes from an organization called Learning Creates, which has been looking at what they call the learner's journey. They're aiming to develop new ways to recognize valued learning that allow 15 to 19 year olds to demonstrate their capabilities. And for example, they argue that a formal CV is not the most reliable or the fairest way to judge whether a young person is the right person for a particular job. And they give some specific examples of different approaches that can help to overcome the bias of a traditional CV, um, for example, based on where a young person went to school. Young people don't develop all these capabilities and strengths on their own, and they don't develop them just at school. This is recognized in the curriculum framework developed by the Year 9 to 12 project, which is a collaboration between all the education sectors in Tasmania. Now, of course, you can't read the image on the screen. Don't worry about that. If you are interested, uh, you can look it up um, yourself on the URL. Um, but importantly, most of the outer circle activities benefit from partnerships. So they include things like learning through projects, um, workplace learning, VET certificates, um, and personal life planning, metacognitive skills, and career planning. Now, this means it's a huge advantage to students if they have access to a range of extracurricular activities, networks with a whole range of different people, uh, supportive and interesting quality part-time work. Uh, they're all useful, but not all young people have access to that. And so it's really important that employers and community organisations actively support young people from disadvantaged backgrounds whether through partnership with schools or outside the school gates. And this investment is of benefit not only for these students, but for our whole community, because we're all better off when society is more equitable. So the idea of the golden mean or the sweet spot, this is the trick that we have to establish to make sure that we support all of our young people to successfully navigate the changing world of work. So first, a balance between recognizing the strengths and interests that young people already have, um, especially when those strengths might not be immediately visible or obvious, but also making sure that we support young people to, to develop a wide range of capabilities that are useful for work and for life. Secondly, a balance between the 21st century capabilities that I've talked about, but also specific knowledge and skills that continue to be important, not just literacy and numeracy, but also core knowledge from the humanities, the sciences and the social sciences. And finally, a balance between seeing schools and TAFE and universities as being responsible for providing young people with these capabilities to navigate work and life, and also recognizing that employers and the wider community have a role to play because learning happens everywhere and it happens throughout life. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty. That's, um, again, added some uh, additional insights into the layered approach to how we develop skills, not only from uh, once we're in the workforce, um, but also throughout um, the, the, you know, the, the pathway into the workforce. Um, there is a poll up. Um, it would be really interesting if you wouldn't mind um, undertaking that poll while we have a look at some of the other questions that um, have, have just a couple of quick ones that have been popping into the Q&A. 
There's a question from Bree in regard to the age range for young people. Um, and Brendan, I believe you're talking about adults aged between 20 and 30. So just to cover off that, uh, that quick question there. And of course, if you have any further questions, please uh, don't be shy, pop your um, questions into the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll get to those in just a moment. But I've got a couple of um, questions that I'd just like to, to ask of the, our panellists before we move on. So even before the pandemic, there was a growing divide in terms of pay and conditions between professional knowledge workers and other occupations. Do you think that the, uh, the divide will increase? And do you, how do you think that we might be able to mitigate the problem? And what does this say for the skills that are in demand? So I might pop that question to Mark and Brendan. Uh, sorry, Terry, you, you broke up. <laughs> so I just missed the first bit of your question there. Okay, I'll ask the question again. There's that even before the pandemic, there was a growing divide in terms of paying conditions between professional knowledge and workers, uh, sorry, professional knowledge workers and other occupations. Do you think that this divide is going to increase uh, now and into the future? And how could we mitigate that problem? And the third part of that question is how do you think um, it might change the way that we see the skills that are in demand? Yeah, I think now, I think post pandemic, or we're not quite out of the pandemic at the moment, we're, we're yeah. still very much in it. Um, I think there's definitely a demand for um, from the worker for remote work opportunities, um, for uh, flexible work, and so I think that's really going to shape the way um, this this folds out in terms of uh, pay and working conditions. And are employers, you know, willing to kind of meet what workers need in terms of those things? Um, and you know. The anecdotal evidence out there suggests that, you know, some organisations, some corporations are very much willing to retain their staff. Um, you know, I think we've seen a lot of discourse around the great resignation. Um, you know, we organisations don't want to lose their staff. And so they're very much um, trying to cater to that. Um, but there's also the other side of it too, where uh, for many organisations, um, they can't no longer cope with having staff at home. Um, they need people back in the workplace. And so I do think it is going to widen some of those disparities. And I think it's um, a real uh, serious problem that we need to think through, uh, not just for organisations, um, but also for policymakers as well, and how we can uh, best go forward to make sure that, you know, workers get what they want, but also that employers have the workforce that they need. Thanks, Brendan. Um, Mark, your thoughts on that question, or that suite of questions? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree completely with everything that Brendan's said then, uh, just now. And um, and another thought is that uh, if we think about the pandemic and, and how it's brought to the fore uh, a lot of these problems, uh, you know, people not wanting to return to the office, people enjoying the flexibility of being able to work from home. I think that what we've seen is uh, perhaps a, a consequence of uh, pandemic and, and the technological capabilities we've had throughout this period, uh, in some sense backfiring on organisations as well because they've had to uh, think of new ways to entice people back to the office to uh, to, um, to to retain staff. Uh, you know, yeah, of course, the great resignation has been a problem in the United States, for example, uh, because I, we've seen the worst cases there where workers simply are not being paid adequately by their employers and uh, and you know the, the enormous amount of memes saying on of signs on doors saying can't find workers willing enough to work uh, but actually what it's done is shown just how poorly those wages and conditions are for those workers uh, throughout many of the industries that we depended on throughout the pandemic and um, so I think that what's happened is uh, in many ways kind of the the very very public face of of uh, what some of my critical perspectives on the on the fourth industrial revolution have been in that uh the goals have been to to use technology to uh to further atomize workers to uh, uh to break down our ability to uh resist 
um, the impact of technology on our on our work and our creativity and our, and our personal lives as well. You know, the encroachment of of technology into our work, uh, sorry, into our into our personal lives uh, that require uh, law to to uh, regulate and to prevent. So, in Portugal, for example, where uh, employers no longer have a right to contact their employees uh, after outside of their working hours. You know, things like that are mm -hmm. examples of how we've been able to demonstrate that guess what, you know, even though technology can reach me wherever I am in the world, uh, whether I'm working or not, whether I'm being paid uh, as an employee or if it's my personal time, um, my rights uh, remain, you know, um, that this is about um, ensuring that human uh, well-being is is a is is a positive outcome from the pandemic as well. So, um, so in terms of mitigating um, some of the the increasing divide, um, I think that there are some really big political economy questions in then in there. Uh, you know, um, this is and in part this answers a question that um, that uh, was raised in the, in the Q and A uh, about whether unions would be important mm. uh, in the fourth industrial revolution and beyond. And and I think absolutely, it's it's it hasn't it has shown more. Uh, than, than many, many times in the past uh, in, in recent history that unions are critical to uh, the future because we, we so often fall into the trap that, of believing that technology is a neutral force of change, that technological change just occurs, when in actual fact it's a very, very political process. And that's uh, clearly evident in, in uh, who is, is a uh, shaping technological change. And I'm talking about people like Jeff Bezos, like uh, Elon Musk, uh, the US military. You know, these are these are big uh, institutions and billionaires that are determining what types of technology uh, are, are being used in our societies uh, to solve problems. It's just that they're not solving the problems that we might have uh, to, to make our lives better. And so um, there are a huge range of policy uh, implications, uh, whether that be forms of basic income or uh, work uh, protection um, income, other other forms of protecting work and, and in providing ability for, for people to retrain if they're laid off due to technological unemployment. Um, and yeah, we are beginning to see uh, jurisdictions around the world tackle some of these issues. Uh, and even in Australia, you know, unions are starting to, to organise uh, the gig economy workers um, and ensure that they have basic protections at work. So um, at the end of the day, I think uh, uh, health and safety um, has, has been shown that, uh, as being a really, really critical uh, piece uh, to consider when we think of uh, work and technology. And, and the pandemic has just brought that to the surface um, and we can't ignore it anymore. So, um, so there, are, there are some ideas that we can, we can attempt. Yeah, so it sort of suggests to me that, A, we may well be um, perhaps uh, offering up the opportunity for that uh, move towards, as you mentioned, the, the industrial democracy with the great res resignation, as it's been called in Australia, the great reshuffle. Um, but I'd also suggest that the, that uh, while skills and capability development is often talked about in terms of employees, it, it, employers also have a, some some space there to, um, to develop how they are dealing with their um, with their workforce as well. So that's sort of a you know two sides of the same coin. But Kitty, I'd like to come to you. Um, what are the two or three top tips that you've got for how employers um, and perhaps policy in the community? can support young people to successfully navigate the changing world of work. Mm, thanks, Terry. Um, and, and just building on, on that discussion there with, with Brendan and, and Mark, I mean, one of the specific um, bits of skills and knowledge that young people need um, is how to navigate work conditions. You know, mm -hmm. how, how do you look at uh, at a contract that you might be asked to sign, what is a, you know a reasonable expectation if you work in a gig economy or, or if you sign up for a casual or a part-time job? Um, what is the role of a union, and particularly young people um, from more more vulnerable backgrounds, whether they're new to Australia or, or whether they they come from intergenerational poverty, may not have that 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 knowledge. And so that's that's one specific thing where where perhaps unions might might have a role to play for example in in providing that knowledge in terms of employers um there's there's so much that workplaces can do to to partner with schools in so many different ways um some of it can be quite intensive partnering that might benefit only a, a small number of young people through um internships and, and school-based apprenticeships and things like that 
or there might be less time consuming ways of partnering that might reach a broader range of young people like being part of career expos and, uh, and mentoring and giving presentations. And so really the key message there is, is that for every workplace and for every, every school, there is something that will work and be suitable for both of you that will benefit young people. Um, the second thing I'd, I would say for, for, um, for workplaces is that in the end, the purpose of a partnership with a school is about learning. It's not about getting a new worker or a new employee. The purpose is learning. Um, and the purpose is learning firstly for the young person. Um, they're still at school. They're still developing. What is it that partnership between you and the school might support that young person with their learning? Um, but importantly, um, also to understand as a workplace, it actually there's a lot that workplaces can learn from that partnership. They can learn from schools and they can also learn from, from the actual young person. Um, and then more broadly for, for you know, everyone in, in the community, I mean, talk with children and young people, find out about what their interests are, what their dreams for the future are, uh, what they need to, to try and make those dreams happen. Um, and start that early, you know, don't wait until they're teenagers, you know, start, start with having those conversations uh, with little kids, um, because all of that is part of helping them to widen their horizons, to open doors to new opportunities. Um, so actually talking with, like, with children and young people um, would be, you know, a major thing that all of us can do. Thanks, Kitty. So it sort of um, su suggests that you know, this isn't necessarily, you know, skills and, and capability development is not something just for schools or universities. It's a whole of community um, enterprise. So thank you for that. One um, other question I have, which I'll put to you all as a collective, what can we do as a community or as an individual to ensure that the future of work is more equitable and accessible, perhaps through access to skills development, not just for young people, of course, the workforce is much more broad than that, but access to skills development suited to a post-pandemic business as usual. So what can we do as a community to make sure that the skills demands are recognised and met? I'll put that to all of you. Look, still, since I'm still hey, unmuted, you're still unmuted. <laughs> I might as well go. Um, so, 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 so one thing that I think um, the pandemic has really shown up, um, particularly in, in relation to school students, um, is that the equity gap has widened due to the pandemic, um, and that a big part of that has been around material basics. Mm -hmm. Some young people do not have access to digital devices and, and to reliable internet. Some young people do not have access to good food unless they can go to school and go to have a breakfast program um, at, at school. And so one of the things uh, around you know, improving equity in the workplace is also to recognize that we may need to support those really basic material necessities uh, for, for some young people who, who may turn up at a job, job interview in an outfit that you don't think is suitable. But that's not because they don't care. It's because they don't have the money to go and, and buy some, some flashy outfit. So material basics, I think, are important. I think it's really important also um, to recognise that for a lot of young people, the last few years um, have had a huge impact on their on their. Um, mental health, their emotional well-being. Um, and so there is a role to play there in uh, the transition then into further study or into the world of work around supporting that, that mental health and, 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 well, and well-being. And um, having a quality job, to, to use Brendan's phrase, can be a really strong supporter of, of, men, of mental uh, well-being. Um, and the third thing I would say is, is you know, an embrace difference. Um, some young people may look a little bit different from what you're used to. Um, they may need a little bit more support to understand the way your workplace works and, and, and the way you do things. But if you give them a chance, um, then you'll not only find that actually they have all sorts of other things to offer that you might not have realised straight away. You don't only contribute to, to equity. You might actually find that they can help you because they are different and they bring different capabilities. They can help you in a workplace to make the way that you do things better rather than just business as usual. Thank yeah, you. 
I think I wanted just to add to what Kitty was saying. Um, I think some of the research that I was doing, you know, really um, highlights how uh, eager young people are to learn. And I, you know, we've, we, we have seen a lot of job subsidies about bringing young people into the workplace and keeping them and retaining them. And, you know, they've been a varying success. Um, for some, they've been cash cows. For some of them, they've been legitimate pathways for young people. Um, but I think it's something that we need to keep in mind, you know, young people, um, uh, there is a lot of discourse out there in the media about generations and generational labels and expectations that we put upon young people. But the facts are that young people, you know, do want to make a successful transition from school to work, um, you know, that they want to have meaningful and promising careers um, and that they do, you know, want to be there for the long term. They're not interested in just being in a workplace for five minutes and moving on to the next thing. Um, so, I, you know, I'm really keen on kind of countering that kind of discourse mm. that's out there um, and that we need to keep investing in young people once they get into the workplace. Thank you. Um, Mark, you might um, perhaps expand the, the discussion out and talk about other people in the workforce, because obviously the, the, the future of work is not just about in, uh, young people. Of course, they're a very uh, important part of the workforce. But as we see perhaps automation and, the, and the, the world of work shifting, how might older people or people who are well into their careers perhaps um, find themselves in more equitable and accessible roles? Yeah, well, um... I think uh, similarly, uh, you know, to, to further to, to Brendan's point just then, um, that, you know, it's really important to counter some of the discourse uh, about the future of work. Uh, my my major gripe has been about um, thinking of, of the future of work as the robots are coming to steal everyone's jobs in the way that the uh, the media often perpetuates that, yeah. that false notion. Um, fundamentally, if the robots were coming, uh, then you know, we would have all been automated out of work because effectively that's what employers want to do. Uh, you know, not all employers, obviously, but, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the purpose of technology in uh, throughout history, you know, the, the slide that I showed has been to uh, cut costs from, from the system, which uh, fundamentally uh, fall largest on uh, labour. So, so the labour side of the spreadsheet is where the biggest costs to employers come from, and uh, and automation has so often been used to to uh, uh, remove that uh, you know the worker from the equation uh, in the pursuit of profit. Um, I think that it's really important to to first of all. Uh, move away from that idea that the robots are coming to do that because um, there's simply not enough. Uh, the, you know, the, there's there's underemployed people everywhere. There's there's not enough people uh, to. There's there's more people working than there is. Um, you know, jobs to, to fulfil us effectively. You know that that we we can't find meaningful work, so we're we're finding people in in terrible jobs and and they're forced to be stuck there uh, because they're not worth automating. Um, so I think that uh, it's really important for us to think of the future of work as, as a, not just about the technology part, but, but actually uh, that there are opportunities to give back to communities, that there are opportunities in, in some of the growth areas of the economy, like the care sector, uh, and, and that these are ways that we can actually understand that the future of work might be more about uh, looking after each other and uh, caring for our young people and for our elderly and our sick. And uh, seeing that those aren't just costs to governments and to societies, but actually enormous opportunities to uh, to create both economic and social benefits. And so, um, trying to to move beyond uh, what are, as well in in this this debate, often uh, hyper masculinized and feminized uh, attitudes, as well as industries, and understanding that there are ways that we can actually. Uh, help people um, fit better into their societies, you know, whether that be uh, very masculinized industries like manufacturing that uh, have been deindustrializing and, and are now uh, becoming more high tech and automated, um, that, that uh, people in those traditional industries can uh, find ways to be retrained and reskilled and give back to their communities in other ways. And, uh, you know, um, and by the same token, uh, uh, feminized industries uh, that there are, perhaps not opportunities for for women to move into masculinized industries i mean if they want to that's absolutely their choice but to sort of uh 
move away from that that terrible stereotype that they aren't worth uh, contributing, they, they have nothing to contribute to the economy, that in fact they are what makes the economy run and that uh, that effectively they're the essential part of the economy that holds everything else together. So, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, that's that's comes full circle back to why I think that the future needs to be, the future of work needs to focus more on the idea of work and how we want to define that and, and, uh, and understanding that it is fundamentally how we're going to shape the future of work. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We could really talk for another couple of hours on this topic because it's so broad. One question we have uh, is how might working from home impact uh, young people early in their careers? And just before I put that to the to the uh, to the panel, we do actually have a session on working from home, which um, uh, you can find on the university website as well. So, um, yeah, how might working from home impact young people early in their careers? Uh, in 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 a minute, Brendan. I think that it's a double-sided coin. Um, I saw some comments recently by, I think, um, uh, a High Court Justice, which suggested that young law clerks return to the office um, pronto. Um, and I, I think that kind of um, gives you a bit of indication that, you know, there there is a bit of a divide out there about, you know, remote work, especially for young people. Um, you know, there might be this idea that uh, young people are trying to um, avoid the office and enjoy the benefits of uh, remote work. Um, but on the other side of it, being in the office is really important for developing, you know, work skills, developing team building skills, um, you know, being seen, which is very important for, re, re, very, very important for, for promotion as well and, and kind of, um, you know, developing one's career. And I think it's also the same for women as well. Um, Mark was talking about um, making uh, the future of work um, better for women. And I think women are often um, punished for flexible work um, because they're often primary caregivers. And I think young people and women are kind of very much in the same position on this issue that, you know, they taking on flexible work is kind of seen as a bad thing. Um, but there is a flip side to it as well, that actually being in the office um, is good for a number of reasons. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it's a, 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 a tricky situation when you know, there, we have this technology that allows us to, to work from home or from, from wherever we are, but there are uh, um, skills, capabilities and some real benefits to be had by being in the office um, working with other people and developing up those um, social aspects of work as well as the, the, the skills-based elements of work as well. Um, I'm afraid we've um, come to the end of our time uh, now. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation with a whole range of different perspectives, each of which we could expand out to a session on, on its own. Um, it is a topic that is close to my own heart in, in, for, in terms of um, uh, diversity and inclusion, as well as the changing nature of work and how our workplaces uh, are needing to shift, as well as our skills and, cap skills and capabilities of employees. So I'd like to, um, to thank our, um, our panel, Dr. Mark Dean, Dr. Prendon Churchill and Dr. Kitty Tarila. Um, this evening's talk will be available soon as a video and a podcast, and you can find this on the university's Island of Ideas website, which is now on your screens. The final forum in our Future of Work series will discuss new patterns of remote and precarious work, migration and settlement, of course, are reshaping the Tasmanian community because of it. We'll discuss how we should prepare for the upcoming changes, certainly an interesting series focusing on issues of profound significance to Tasmania's future, but also Australia more broadly. You'll be able to register for our upcoming session on the Island of Ideas website and the entire Island of Ideas series is also available via this site, which is now on your screens. And indeed, you'll be able to find that working from home material there too. Thank you so much for taking part in this event and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you.